the quality of, um, of garb has just continued to go up. The quality of armor has gone up. It was pretty good when I started, but when I look back at some of the older pictures and of the armor and stuff they had, it's like, wow, you know? That was something that we were proud to make things in our backyards. Oh, there were some really hideous projects. <laughs> I fought, in, when I authorized in AS-10, I think, I authorized in a helm that was made by Sir Christian of Orange. It was made from an old air compressor tank. It was grossly illegal. We had to add parts to it to make it sort of barely legal. Everybody that wore that got the same scar right here. Um, <laughs> but there was this thing of, you felt it. You could make armor in your backyard. You know, good for them for, for getting us started and working with what they had and what they knew. And there wasn't as, you know, there wasn't the internet for research and things like that. But that has just gone way up. Um, someone getting on the field for the first time, they can go out and buy this really nice quality kit. You know, you can actually, you know, if you don't want to build it yourself, you could go out and buy virtually off the rack a, a kit that when I started 20 years ago, people would have been like, oh, wow, look how good that is. And you could just go buy that off the rack now. And they called up Sir Hugh and it came to his practice and we put on carpet armor. And a, free, a made free on can of helm and put that on. And with hockey gear, I was I was at practicing within like two weeks. Uh, there are certain things, certain pieces of armor that I do know specific incidences. When I was Earl Marshal, <coughs> you had to have protection on the hand and on the elbow. There was no requirement for any armor on the forearm, and a fair number of fighters did not use any armor on their forearm. There was no arm armor regulation, so I just wrapped a, a sheet around it. was two layers of, of, of pillowcase, you know, so the armor was only psychological, was just to go make me feel better about myself. You know, and in one six-month period, I had six broken forearms. Three of them were officially reported. Three of them I heard about through friends. Four out of the six occurred at fighting practices, and I think more injuries occur at fighting practices because people spend more time fighting at practice. Two of them had occurred at events. I felt I had to do something about it. One theory <coughs> was that this was caused because, because our armor had improved we were swinging the weapons harder and we'd learned how to swing the weapons harder because 40 years ago we were not that effective of fighters. Um, but the question of making people swing the less weapons less hard is very difficult. How do, you, how do you control that on the battlefield? Another theory was that people are using the sword to block head blows and they're putting the sword up like that and they're getting hit on the forearm and it breaking their forearm. So they shouldn't be allowed to block blows with their sword <laughs> headshots. Well, that's another hard thing to control. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I felt that I could control was requiring armor on the forearm. And that worked really well. The requirement that I put into effect was only eight ounce leather with a half inch of closed cell foam behind it. So it really wasn't a lot of armor. But for whatever reason, we stopped having broken forearms. And when I came, became our marshal, I was the one who put the regulations that both sides of the elbow, both elbows had to be armored. And I did it because Christian of Orange went and got a great sword and hit my elbow when I had my shield. And up until that, you only needed the one, the one, or in this the, case, the exposed one. The exposed one had to be armored. Mm -hmm. I armored both because I'm paranoid. We didn't have a requirement for a chin strap and a helmet when I joined the SCA. And I'm probably the one responsible for that because at an event in the Kingdom of the West, I 
nailed a person in the faceplate, and he was wearing a helmet that he'd gotten from another fighter, Paul Bellatrix, that had cheek pieces that were inserted to keep the helmet in place instead of a chin strap. Well, when I hit him with the polearm, I pushed the helmet into his face and chipped three teeth. Which sort of, you know, it, it took some of the fun out of our melee. <laughs> um, and after that, the, uh, after that event, uh, one of the knights went to Paul, who was king, and said, we should ban that weapon from the field. <laughs> And Paul said, no, we're just not used to fighting with it. There's nothing wrong with the weapon. And Paul appointed a commission led by Douglas Longshanks. And because I was the person who was doing most of the fighting with the polearm, he put me on the commission as well. And so I contributed my experience to Douglas's report. And Douglas reported saying, basically, the problem is with the helmets. The helmets need to have chin straps in them fastened so that the helmet cannot be pushed onto the face. And so the armor was improved because of the weapon. If the weapon hadn't been brought onto the field, you know, certainly sooner or later someone else would have made a pole arm and started, started thrusting blows with it as well as cutting blows. Um, so the, free, like the free on can helmets started changing when they when people were improving their swordsmanship, and Hugh was Earl Marshal of the Principality when he was involved in an incident that caused him to change the rules about Freon cans. One of the fighters in the Brotherhood of the Blade, Randolph Devious, was learning to fight with two swords. And he was doing his standard practice of fighting everyone one at a time in line, and Randolph would come out with two swords, and he was having a harder time killing Randolph when he was fighting with two swords. So the third time Randolph got to the head of the line with his two swords, Hugh said, hold on a minute, put his shield down, and picked up another sword, and Randolph stepped out, and Hugh flat snapped him, both sides of the helmet, both swords at the same time. He crushed the helmet about two inches, and it couldn't be taken off Randolph's head. Unfortunately, this was Hugh's backyard, so they just led Randolph around to Hugh's armor shop and cut the helmet off of his head. But Hugh said, okay, uh, we'll allow Freon cans for the next three months while we upgrade Freon cans, but from then on, Freon cans have to have a steel band at the bottom and at the temple and at the top. <laughs> so. And then fortunately, more people got into armoring, and now who would wear a free on camp to an event? And, uh, my first helmet I made out of uh, half inch diameter round rebar. And <clears throat> because I had a neurological condition, and the first thing the neurologist asks is, Have you been hit on the head? I wanted to make a helmet that would sit on my shoulders so I wouldn't be hit on the head. And I took aluminum wire and I made a framework that would fit over my head and then I measured the lengths of the aluminum wire and went down to a surplus yard and bought half inch diameter smooth rebar and had it cut to the right lengths and then I took it back to my apartment and bent it to shape and then I taped the whole thing together with, uh, uh, with masking tape. And I took it to a welding shop and said, can you weld this everywhere where the masking tape is? And then I covered it with two layers of hardware cloth and took it to the next SCA event and said, will this work? And the eye slots were too far apart, but Hugh said, bring it by my garage Sunday morning and we'll add some pieces of steel to it and it'll work fine. <laughs> So, and I used that helmet for probably four or five years. My original armor I made out of split cane fencing. I was able to buy a roll of split cane fencing for $20, and then I made it on the kitchen floor in my apartment with a little electric jigsaw, and I'd say, okay, I need a 
a piece of armor this long, so that long, and it should be this long, so I would cut it twice as long as that, and then fold it in so that the canes made like little leaf springs. And then I put duct tape over the whole thing, and I put carpet padding, uh, carpet tiles on the inside for padding. And it was a light, effective armor, and it worked really well until Hugh taught us to uh, make articulated steel legs. <coughs> and uh, it was it was much more effective than the uh, the carpet armor. Mm -hmm. When I joined the SCA, most people were wearing carpet armor, and their knee protection were pieces of steel which were attached to steel greaves. So. The weight from the knee protection and the steel waves all rested on the ankle, and that made you somewhat slower on the battlefield and <coughs> a little sort of lead-footed. Um, <coughs> about six months after I joined the SCA, Sir Hugh went up to Rieslingshire and spent a weekend with Jay Bliss, who was a master armor, armorer who developed a lot of early patterns, and he came back with a pattern for making steel legs where the knee protection and the thigh protection were all one piece of armor. And Hugh, being an excellent metal craftsman, in one weekend built himself a pair of steel legs. <coughs> and then he decided he was going to have a series of workshops with the Brotherhood of the Blade, and he gave eight of us an opportunity to help make 10 pairs of steel legs, and we would each get a pair of legs to keep and to fight with, and he would sell the extra two pairs of legs to cover his costs for materials. And <clears throat> so Charles of Dublin, uh, Martin the Temperate, me, and five other fighters <laughs> spent every Sunday morning over at Hugh's shop, and we learn to cut out the patterns and to bend the pieces and how to articulate the knees and we all ended up with our steel legs and I tried on the pair of steel legs that Hugh had made and because they were attached at the belt you were not carrying the weight on the ends of your feet and you were able to move much more quickly and they were very maneuverable and very nice and they've lasted a long, long time. <laughs> I've had to replace a few rivets, but that's about it. And straps, of course, leather yeah. straps. I have uh, greaves on my, my legs. I'm the only one of the Brotherhood legs uh, were a bliss design. I'm, I'm the only one that has uh, shin protection with those legs because I'm paranoid. I've been hit there a couple of times because I've been fighting 42 years, you know. Charles of Dublin's original armor consisted of a sheet that he would wrap around his body, and then he'd put a piece of tape on it, and then he'd put his carpet armor over that and a belt around that, and he'd take a pillowcase and wrap it around his forearm, and that was his forearm armor. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we fought in. <laughs> you know, and, and so I'm in, in carpet armor. And one time, the, the strap broke. You know, it's got a, a, a strap that secures it. So it broke. Only had one strap. So what I did was I took a belt and I belted it to me. And it turns out, and you have to remember this. It turns out that carpet is actually just like a t-shirt. A thick t-shirt, but a t-shirt, if you belt it to you. The reason why carpet armor is effective is there's a layer of air between it and you. If you take that layer of air out, you're wearing a t-shirt. Which I found out when could that practice of all the practices, I never got hit in the stomach. But this practice, I did by Thomas the Merciless. And it really hurt. And you expel a lot more air from your lungs than you think you have. It just kept coming out and coming out. And I thought, you know, I may die. 
because I can't just keep, I, you know, I have to breathe in at some point. And I just thought I was going to die that. That was one time where I thought I was going to die. Um, and eventually I breathed in. But it took a very, very, very long time, much longer than you'd expect. Um, so it's a thing that you have to, you know, and, and so our, our arms weren't armored. The only thing that was armored was the, the elbow. Um, as people got better armor, you know, it took me a while to go out of carpet, get armor for the arm, you know, the, the arm, upper arms. Uh, it took me a much longer while to get armor for here. <laughs> you know. The carpet armor was simply available. I remember at the time when carpet armor was available and worn by most fighters, hearing Mikey McFergie telling a fighter how he could make plate armor. He said, you go to the junkyard and you take a tin snips with you. They have one hour fire rated doors there that have steel faces on them. So you just cut the steel facing off of the one hour fire rated door and you get three size logs. One that's about like that, one that's about like that, and one that's about like that. And then you use your hammer and you beat the steel around the logs and you use the small ones for arm armor and the medium ones for leg armor and the big ones for body armor. <laughs> And that's how my he made armor and, and then we went through a period of plastic armor where uh, um, Trigby was the first one to make plastic armor and he, uh, he and Jason were the first two fighters to wear plastic armor and it was functionally sort of like a boiled leather armor but it was made out of plastic and they uh, would uh, heat it up in an oven and if you wanted to make a breastplate, you would take a couple sweatshirts and you would soak them in water and you'd put these sweatshirts on. Then you would heat the piece of plastic up and you would lie down and your friend would put the plastic over you and use some things to form it around your chest. And someone who had one of these breastplates and said, after a couple minutes, it starts to get really hot because the water in the sweatshirts is turning into steam <laughs> while it's cooling the plastic off but it's turning into steam and so it starts to really get hot <laughs> okay, now you asked me for a fun memory and this one I, I really haven't shared my first arm was made out of green plastic pickle barrel from McDonald's and I would take two pieces of glass of the barrel and I would sew them together with a piece of, of closed cell foam inside and I got more armor bites and more bruises from my own armor than I ever did from someone fighting. But on the other hand, I could get the barrels for free. And the, the, at that time, the, the closed cell foam wasn't all that expensive. So I was able to get in here with this very funky armor. It was two steps above the uh, uh, conveyor belt armor, which I had also seen. And I thought I was really high class, you know. So long as I pulled my pants up and kept them up so you couldn't see the green plastic, it was good. <laughs> the pickle barrel armor was a different one. Michael Maggot Slayer was the one man who made armor out of pickle barrels. And he thought that these would lend themselves to it very well. And he made a set of body armor out of pickle barrels. And then he was just getting into fighting. He'd been in the SCA for a bit, but he was just getting into fighting. He handed his wife a baseball bat and said, hit me. <laughs> and so she hit him and he said, no harder. So she hit him a little harder. He said, no, hit me really hard. So she did. And he said, oh, this isn't going to work. <laughs> the actual, yes, it was Michael Maggot Slayer who made the pickle barrel armor. And it was his wife, Amadea de Strada Dragonessa, who showed him that the pickle barrel was not structurally viable for armor. 